Hey, John, welcome back. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again, buddy. So with uh, all the college students going back to school um, and also new incoming college students, I want to talk to you a little bit about, about college parties. Sure, sure. That's uh, always a hot topic as we as we get into uh, late August, early September, um, especially in the Boston area with all the colleges and universities. Um, a lot of uh, first time uh, people being away from home. Uh, and so that can oftentimes lead to some issues with campus police, local police, and then unfortunately, uh, the courts. Right. So let's set up a typical example. Um, neighbors in Boston are not happy about a party going on. There's a noise complaint. The police show up. What is your advice in terms of what people should do? Cooperate. First and foremost, um, and that that comes from uh, experience, uh, you know, from having uh, been in those situations uh, in college, like most of us have been. Um, but unfortunately, you know, oftentimes the people that we end up having to help are the ones who just couldn't leave, right, and, and couldn't keep their mouth shut. And, and the police don't take kindly to that. No. And they don't forget that either. When we have those hearings, um, there's usually one person uh, who is the target of their uh, anger, you know, so to speak, it, it, and that's the person that you and I end up having to represent most of the time. Uh, and so it's really about damage control and trying to mitigate, um, you know, the, the situation and, and what occurred. But, you know, my best advice to those, those students and, and those uh, housemates uh, is that if you're ever in that situation, end the party right? When the police show up, end it, get everyone out of the house, that's going to go a long way, right? They're going to, they're going to have some, you know, uh, respect for you for, you know, cooperating and making their job easier, <clears throat> you know, but putting yourself in the shoes of the police at that point, you know, there's only, you know, say four or five of them that respond. And there's 150, you know, 19 to 22 year olds who are hammered. Right. And so now you have to deal with that situation. And, and a lot of people at that age, um, you know, can't really control themselves when they get under the influence. Right. They're not that experienced in, in alcohol consumption or God only knows what else is in their system at that point. So, um, you know, the police are trying to protect everyone, certainly protect themselves. Uh, and, and so the best thing you can do is certainly as, as someone who's on the on the lease and lives there is try to get everyone out because you're on the lease, you're gonna get summons to court, even if you weren't there. And that's happened many times where we've had people who've been out of state and they get summons to, to answer to charges and they weren't even there. Yeah, and the worst thing you can start doing is telling people you're a con law expert and uh, start telling them you can't come in here without a search warrant. And that might be true, right? Like it's true that you can't search your apartment without a search warrant, but that's not the best way to go because they no. against you. No, and, I, and I've had people, you know, that, that I've represented before uh, who, who then on, on other things, say this, uh, so to speak, and they end up calling me at, at three o'clock in the morning, you know, because uh, it's, you know, the police are coming in and I'm going to call my attorney. And, uh, you know, if I answer the phone and, and, and now I'm angry that I'm answering the phone at three o'clock in the morning and they're <laughs> asking for my advice, my advice is shut your mouth and get everyone out of the house. Right. And, and that's it. And that's that's. It's the only thing to do at that point. Otherwise, you're going to get arrested, right? And so, to me, right. is that really worth it? You know, you're gonna you're gonna have to hire us now to 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 arrange, you know, be with you at your arraignment the following Monday, and um, when you could have just got out of that with a warning, or at worst, a magistrate's hearing two months later. Right, and the big difference between those two is if you are arraigned, and even though it's dismissed later on, there's still a border probation record history that's an entry on your record. Uh, versus like yeah. just not arraigned on it. No one really knows about it. It's not something you need to disclose to an employer. But now we're starting to see a lot of applications that have you ever been arrested before, right? So even if it's a magistrate hearing, but you've been arrested, that's something that you may have to answer in the affirmative with these applications that you're going to be applying for maybe your dream job. Right. And that's a question we get a lot is, um, you know, will this show up on my my record, you know, will, will, a, will a Corey check reveal this? And so, you know, to me, that's, our job is significantly more difficult when somebody is arrested because the only thing we can do to help to, to prevent that 
is getting a case dismissed prior to arraignment. So now you're giving me an hour or less to try to convince a prosecutor not to arraign you. Whereas if you hadn't been arrested, it's two months. We can try to work it out with the clerk, magistrate, work it out with the police officers so that it never even goes to the arraignment session. And now it, it obviously it's as if it never happened, right? Because you're not being arraigned. The arraignment is what triggers the entry on the, on the board of probation record. So um, it just, it makes it incredibly difficult. And like I tell people, it's, you know, no matter what job you're applying for, if, it, if you were applying to work for, for Seed and Chan, and it was down to two people and you had an entry on your record and the other person it didn't, who am I gonna pick, right? Just based on that, I'm gonna go with somebody that's never been in trouble before. So um, even if it was foolish, if it was just a keeper of a noisy and disorderly home, you know, that, that tells me something. So, you know, th there's th that level of cooperation um, and trying to help goes a long way. I've never seen it backfire in court, right, where, where we had a magistrate's hearing because the officers will say, you know, Sam Smith was, uh, you know, he, he tried his best. He was trying to get everyone out of there, you know, but, you know, he's, he lived there and he was, he admitted that, you know, he had people over and, and so that's why we're here today. But, you know, there's opportunities, there's alternative resolutions in a magistrate's hearing where we can kind of, you know, prevent the arraignment down the road. That's so important. So you got to cooperate. You got to be try to be a good person. And also remember that, you know, the police make an effort, a, a concerted effort. When school starts or right after winter break, they look out for these things, right? They're driving around, they're listening to loud music. They're trying to keep the neighborhood um, kind of in, in, in working order where residents can go to work the next day. And that's what their number one complaint with college students, right? The noise, the noise. Right. And you, and you have to think about the specific neighborhoods of like, of Alston and Brighton, um, town of Brookline. I mean, all of those areas are so mixed and diverse with families who've been there for hundreds of years in some of those houses. And then right next door, is a rental property, right? And so it's just, you know, to me, it's, I don't know why you'd live there, you know, knowing that, you know, that's a, that's right for college students to be renting next door, but, you know, that's their, right? That's their property. And so they're, they're going to have less patience for, you know, those parties uh, and, and they get, they get ridiculous. I mean, we've all been there, you know, so it's just a matter of, what can you do to to end it when it gets to the level of uh you know police getting involved uh, unfortunately we've seen them where it just it's so out of control that that the people who you know own the own the or leasing leave because you know, they can't get everybody out so they just take off uh so yeah um yeah that being said far too, better to just try to cooperate if, if it's people who've been in those houses for a long time and it's a family house can completely understand the development over the years that kind of started pushing college students further and further off campus into these. Yeah. So I can completely understand why residents would be upset about that also, no, it, but it's a tough right. situation it, all around, but you guys. It see. is. And I can recall, you know, when I was a prosecutor in Brighton, I, you know, they, they invited me to several neighborhood meetings, you know, and yeah. be in specific pockets and, and, you know, they were upset about kids not being held accountable, you know? And so yeah. as a DA, I had to explain to them, well, they are, you know, it's just not how you probably want. They're not going to go to jail, you know, so that's not going to happen. But these people are having to go to court. They are being placed on, you know, kind of some probationary status. They are having to do community service through the Boston police. There are a lot of things in place that they had to do that just wasn't real public knowledge to the people who, who lived in the, in the neighborhood. But they were trying to be proactive in preventing it. And, you know, and I said, look, as long as there's going to be college kids in the area, you it's, this is going to happen. You know, you're going to have this. This is just part of the deal. Right. Well, John, thanks for uh, coming on today. Let's have you back again soon. All right, buddy. Thanks for having me. Take care.